On today's bulletin, I have Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. And it states, Do not fear for what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, so that you will be tested, and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The crown of life is, I think, something that we need to think about from time to time. And the reason that I think we should think about it is because there's twofold issues. One, as I have as a part of the blog today, there is a cost associated with the crown of life. And I guess if you really wanted to peel back the onion to what does it cost to get the crown of life? Your personal will, your self-will that is in contradiction to God's will, not only for you, but for all of mankind. That's the cost of the price that it takes to have the crown of life. The other reason why I think it's something for you and I to always think about is because that's the reward. And when we think about the things of life that we go through and what we may go through in the very near future, or even years down the road, depending on how long our lives may last or how long time may go on. Don't forget the reward that lays out there. At the gym that Leanne and I go to, there's a saying on one of the shirts that says, when you feel like giving up, don't remember why you started. And you think about that, it's like a circle. Yeah, I'm tired, I'm worn down, but I did all this so that I could develop more strength and become stronger. And when we go through the things of life that we will go through in the future, whatever they may be, never forget the reward that's out there for us. I'd like for us today, if you have your Bibles, to turn over to James chapter 1 and start there. In James chapter 1, it says, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. James is telling us that the individual who will persevere, when you feel like giving up, just push a little more. I think there's an old saying that I used to hear, you know, feel like you're at the end of your rope, tie a knot, and hang on. Sometimes that's the best you can do is hang on. But don't give up is the point. And, you know, you keep pushing and you strive through any, whatever the trial may be, a personal trial, a trial for the church, a trial for this whole world. And we know of great trials coming in the form of the Great Tribulation. And we know that there is persecution that we're guaranteed because Jesus even said, it's only through much tribulation that you will enter into the kingdom of heaven. So just because we enter into the relationship doesn't mean that it's all going to be, as we might say, hunky-dory. Everything's fine. And now it's all smooth sailing from here. No, we're probably going to hit a lot of headwinds because we have an adversary that wants to get us off the course and take us away from the prize. And a part of our persevering, a part of it, is so that we can be approved. We can prove our love for the Father, our love for Jesus Christ. And that's a part of what he says here when he says it's a promise to those who love him. A promise to us is this crown of life. Let's turn over to Revelation chapter 2. I do think sometimes, you know, I've oftentimes heard athletes make a comment that they before doing something that is like going to win a game, let's say a field goal kicker, before they begin to even get up there and, and kick the ball to win the game, they envision themselves doing it and it being successful. Now, really, the envision is not the success. The success comes from the doing, but the point of it is, is you never forget what the goal is, and it pushes you on. Just for the sake of context, we'll begin in verse 8. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, the first and the last, who was dead 
and has come to life says this. So he's identifying who it is. It's Jesus Christ. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, which gives us an indication that this the individuals of this particular church may be physically poor, but they're spiritually rich. Unlike what we see in the form of Laodicea, where they're possibly physically rich, but spiritually poor. He goes on to say, and the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. This crown of life is salvation. This crown of life is, is the eternity for which the second death has no power over. That's the goal we are aiming for, what we're striving for, and we have to endure. And enduring can be the hardest part because we want it to happen because we want the goal. But sometimes the human part of us, we don't want to put in the effort in order to get the goal. We see that in society, self-gratification, instant gratification. Oh, I want that car. I'm going to go ahead and sign for seven years at this $1,000 a month to get that car I want. And I can drive it. And not putting in the effort to, to you know, really be able to afford something. And we see people sometimes even, they don't count the cost regarding what their intentions are when they enter into the relationship. And Jesus makes the comment that, you know, the person who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not fit. And we don't want to fall into that category. So we want to think through all of this. And this, this image that's given is this crown image. And I don't know what comes to your mind. There are a lot of different types of crowns. This is the crown that's in called the imperial state crown. And it is the crown that was placed on the coffin of the recent Queen Elizabeth of England. And you look at that crown, it's pretty impressive. The crown itself weighs about two pounds, 13 ounces, 2,800 diamonds, 273 pearls, sapphires, emeralds, rubies. Impressive. But I'm not sure that that should be the goal of our life. As valuable as that may contribute and account towards regarding financial gains. There's another crown that may come to your mind. And if you watch the series on Netflix called The Crown, you probably saw the scene in which a young Queen Elizabeth, when it was determined that she should become the individual that was a monarch, she had to practice putting it on her head so she could walk with it because it was so heavy. This one's the St. Edward's crown. It actually is one that's been used in coronations going all the way back to 1269. And this is one, though, is a little heavier, five pounds of pure gold and various jewels on it as well. And if you recall in that one scene when she was putting that crown on, she had to balance her body, make her head be able to hold the weight of that crown. And she made the reference to the individual that the weight of the crown was more than just physical weight on their head. The weight of the crown that you and I are striving for is going to involve more than even some of the physical things we may have to go through. It's going to involve a significant amount of effort on our part as well to endure. I found it interesting when I was doing a little bit of research on this St. Edward's crown. When that is given and will be sometime in the future with the current king who will become king, I guess officially, in a coronation, the Archbishop of Canterbury makes a statement each time. It says, God crown you with a crown of glory and righteousness, that having a right faith and manifold fruit of good works, you may obtain the crown of an everlasting kingdom by the gift of him 
whose kingdom endures forever. There's a lot of interesting comments and, and I guess parallels in that when you think about it. While the monarch in 1269 had a lot more power than the monarch of today in England has, that wasn't the point of the crown. The point of the crown was the right fate, the good works. And those were things that were to be a part of the one whose kingdom will endure forever. Think about yourself in the crown that you and I are striving to obtain. It involves the right faith. It can't come just any way, as well as it requires good works over a course of time. And we're following the individual and their footsteps in the form of Jesus Christ, whose kingdom will endure forever. We don't do it our way, as Frank Sinatra would say. We do it Jesus Christ's way. We walk in the way of Jesus Christ. I find a lot of interesting parallels there that when you think about it, should resonate within you and resonate within me. In the first song we had today, we talked about a diadem. There is a difference between a diadem or diadai, diaday, as well as, as a crown. A diadem is a symbol of the power of rulership. A crown, on the other hand, is a symbol of a reward for victory and a mark of honor as a result of that, achieving for the good works. And when you think about it, if we, as Christians, as disciples of Jesus Christ, our master, if we're faithful in producing the fruits of good works, and are not us, it's God and Jesus Christ working in us, so it's through their grace, then we will be crowned at Christ's second return with the crown of life, not the diadem of life. We will have rulership, but the focus is on our faith now and our works now. The right faith, the right beliefs, and submitting to the will of God, because many times our works are self-righteous works, not the righteous works of God. So the cost is a little higher than maybe some may think when we consider this. I go back to James 1, 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Some tra this one translation I found interesting. For he has to be proved, or he has to prove, that he will receive the crown of life. The word proved in the Greek, I have the word up there, means you stood the test. You test it out to be trustworthy. A sterling worth is another meaning for it, like a metal that is cleansed from all alloys. In other words, it's pure. We talk about the pure in heart. Jesus talked about it. You and I are to be pure in heart. And that purification process, I would submit to you and to myself, is a whole embodiment of the Holy Day season process, of purification, not only for us, but for us to be used as a tool even to bring others to salvation. But Jesus Christ is the one who purifies all of our sins. And it's not us, but it's his kingdom that will reign forever. And I find it interesting, too, that this particular Greek word has more than one form. It can also mean the successful testing of precious metals and coins to make sure that they're genuine. You know, we looked at the imperial crown. We looked at the St. Edward's crown, the pictures of it. They're, they're beautiful. And they're, they're both worth a significant amount of money, for sure, because of the value it's associated with them. But those stones, that gold, is pure. Through endurance and through the successful proving of our love for Jesus Christ, as James says, we can, through the process of the purification of the ongoing forgiveness of our sins and our desire to put the self-will down and exercise the will of our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, 
we will be purified ultimately throughout time. When you think about what the actual crown of life represents, this goal that we're striving for, of why we go through what we go through, why when we want to give up, we have to think about why we started. And no matter how difficult times may become in our personal relationships, maybe our family, no matter what, we will continue to push on, I think is, is very indicative of the actual term crown that James uses as well. The Greek word comes from stenephos, which means a victor's crown. And it is a person that means that they have to overcome and they have to endure and they have to successfully complete their task whatever it is that's laid down before them and we have a a huge help in the form of jesus christ in the form of the father rendering aid to us but you know we receive that oftentimes because of our relationship and our relationship is driven by our desire and our desire is fueled by our prayer, our communication, all these things work together. And we can't neglect one. We can't become successful if we're not having ongoing dialogue. And prayer is not just a reciting of words like, air quotes, cultural Christianity, and their repressive prayers are recessing nothing but more than the Lord's Prayer. It, that's not what developing a relationship, not a close relationship where you pour out your heart like David did. That comes from having an open relationship. It's interesting, too, that there are a lot of metaphors in the Bible regarding crowns. Let's turn over to Ezekiel chapter 16. Even in the Old Testament, there are symbols for crowns. And these things, I think, are, are indicative of how important the crown is that we're striving for, the crown of life. As you know, God gave a parallel to a marriage between him and children of Israel, ancient Israel. And there's a lot of parallels that he gives. But here in chapter 16 and verse 12, he makes reference. He says, and I also put a ring in your nostril. Now, that may sound a little strange to us, but their cultures are different and earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. You know, and he talks about the jewelry and the how he just lavished on his wife, Israel, and this type of symbolism, and yet we know they didn't successfully complete that marriage because of what? Their unbelief. Belief is very, very important. Same book, chapter 21, a few pages over. God in the form of the prophet makes the, the idea that he clothed Israel with so much and gave them their, their righteousness and they just sold it off for the world and the ways of the world. But in chapter 21, verse 26, says, thus says the Lord, remove the turban and take off the crown. This will no longer be the same. Exalt that which is low and abase that which is high. So he was so fed up with ancient Israel and what they failed on that he eventually would divorce as much as he hated it. He would divorce them and he would take off that crown that he gave to them. There's also parallels in Proverbs chapter 12. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 12. To a parallel of a crown, something that, again, it's, it's, a, it's a symbol, and it's not something we should cast off. That's why we should hold this in high regard in our minds. But in chapter 12 of Proverbs, verse 4, an excellent wife is a crown of her husband, and she who shames him is like the rottenness of his bones. You know, I think Jesus Christ, the God of the Old Testament, could very much attest to this particular proverb. He wanted an excellent wife. He wanted them to be a peculiar people. He wanted them to be so much more. And they took that crown and they traded it for their cultural society around them. Do you and I trade things for cultural Christianity? Something to think about. And it was it, it created a rottenness that God could not was could not live with. 
There's also parallels in chapter 17, 6 to grandchildren being a crown, of old age being a crown, riches being a crown. And then in Psalm 65, 11, there's even this idea of a harvest being a crown. When you think of yourself in Pentecost as a first fruit, a harvest of the first fruit, that is like a crown for the Father through that Jesus Christ offers up. And we follow in his steps. And it's a very similar pattern. Let's do turn over, though, to Psalms chapter 103. Psalms chapter 103. And in verse 4. Who redeems your life from the pit and who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion? You know, the crown... If we stay faithful in this relationship that we are to develop is one for which there's loving kindness and there's mercy given to us. But we have to stay in the relationship and, and no matter what, endure whatever lies ahead. Let's turn over to Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. Another parallel is given here for us to consider. Regarding crowns and verse five. <clears throat> In that day, the Lord of hosts will become a beautiful crown. And the glorious diadem to the remnant of his people. You know, when Jesus makes the comment about. Lift up your head, look high before your salvation is nearer than you thought. And your redemption draws nigh. That'll be a crowning moment. For those who remain faithful to the very end. And the remnant, the few, because it's not the only day of salvation. It's a smaller harvest, but the remnant, it'll be a significant crown that was awaiting for us. And I don't think any of this is at all coincidence that we've been reading through. I think all of this fits formally into what the New Testament writers were talking about regarding this crown, whether it's James, whether it's uh, John and what he's receiving and the revelation through the revelator, Jesus Christ and, Re and revelation, it all fits back to these Old Testament images. And in, as a matter of fact, it fits very closely to the church. Let's turn back to Exodus chapter 28. We know in Galatians that the apostle Paul makes reference that the church is the Israel of God. After the physical descendants of Abraham, not all, but significant amount, chose to turn against that relationship that he had set aside for them, then he starts working through the church. And that becomes the Israel that we were reading earlier in Ezekiel. But specifically, the church is to be a kingdom of priests. And even the priests of the Old Testament had a certain crown that they were given as far as what their service was. And in Exodus chapter 28, verse 36, and of course there were a lot of other parts of the garment that Aaron was to wear as the high priest. He says, and you shall also make a plate of pure gold and shall engrave on it like the engravers of a seal, holy to the Lord. So the priests of God, as a part of the turban that was on their head that God would later say, take off, as we read earlier in Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel 21. But on that was a, an inscription that said that you, as the high priest, were holy, set apart to the Lord, set apart to God, sanctified to God. And that was a part of what was a part of their physical garment. Chapter 29, just a page over. In verse 6, and you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. So this pure gold, as we said earlier, I think the imagery that James is drawing from is very much similar in nature to what we're talking about here. There's a purity that comes through being proven to love God. And the priests were to love God because they were set apart for God's service. And yet, that, that whole thing seemed to not work very well either. Let's turn over to chapter 39 of Exodus, same book. And here we'll read verse 30. 
And they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold and inscribed on it like the engravings of a signet, holy to the Lord. So God gave them the instruction. And they actually did it. And it was a part of what was on that high priest's head. And you think about it, when Aaron wore that, when he went in on the Day of Atonement, he was representing Jesus Christ as our high priest, based on what we see in the book of Hebrews. Jesus Christ was definitely set apart. And he was set apart for a very specific purpose, to build reconciliation of you and I to the Father, to reconcile through the atoning blood. And he was set apart for that purpose. You and I should set ourselves apart to be reconciled to the Father through Jesus Christ, to endure no matter how long it may take, so that we can have a pure love for Jesus Christ and for the Heavenly Father. I kind of go back to that idea about diadem versus crown. The crown of life is a crown of righteousness when we think about it. The, the priests were to make the people reconciled to, to God. And of course, we know that was done through bulls, blood, and goats, and whatnot. And, and we know in Hebrews that none of that could wash away sin. It was only the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. So all of that was representations, just like this crown was a representation. Hopefully, it's a representation of you. Hopefully, it's a representation of me, of doing what's right and overcoming sin. And we realize that when we have the things in our lives to endure. Oftentimes you hear this, the three S's, Satan, society, and the self. Satan can influence society. Society can put pressure on us, and then we got a judgment call. What are we going to do? Are we going to do what God says? Are we going to cave to peer pressure? And oftentimes we talk about peer pressure when we're talking about teenagers and we're talking about young kids. I'm here to tell you, I've seen peer pressure. I've experienced peer pressure as an adult as well. And I can tell you that even adult peer pressure can be even stronger than teenage peer pressure or children. peer pressure. And you and I have to make a choice sometimes. And that may put us in a different light. I remember years and years ago when I was a young kid and I was playing baseball in high school and, you know, Came up, of course, we're in the championship series for the city, and the game has to be played on a Friday night. And my parents, I was a starting center fielder, and my parents said, he's not going to play. They lost that game. Put us in another bracket, so we played Saturday night. Coach would not let me start because I did not come that Friday night. I sat on the bench. A lot of my teammates were unhappy with me, and I was like, just do with my parents. We did eventually win that next game, though, and everyone kind of forgot about all that stuff after that. But sometimes, even as parents, we have to make choices for our small children, what they will participate in and what they will not participate in. And that gets older in life, and then we have to make some decisions, what we will participate in and what we will not participate in. And sometimes as parents, we can either set a good course or we can set a bad course. I know that there's some that have set some wide open courses and some that set some super strict courses and the kids went off in the wrong ways in both cases. The point of it is, is that if you're gonna set a course, you better start talking and communicating. Our father talks to us in prayer if we talk to him. And these things in prayer will lead us so that we can overcome. And it will help us along the way. And ultimately, we all realize that it's only through Jesus Christ that we are overcomers. It's not through ourselves. And you think about the New Testament writers. They use the terms, the Stephanos, and they use the term as well for diadem. And they, and they use it in a couple of different ways. James, the Apostle Paul, as we'll see in a minute, Peter are using crown. For something that is what we're talking about here, righteousness, a symbol of righteousness, of life, of a certain light, way of life. But we also know that this whole idea of the diadem about rulership. And it is interesting when you think about this, the term, that the Greek word that's used for diadem, 
its rulership can be good and it can be bad in the Bible. In fact, Revelation 12, 3, the dragon, Satan, he wears seven diadems. Same word. Revelation 13, 1, the beast that comes up out of the sea, he has authority, and it's the same word for diadem. Revelation 19, 12, a diadem is used, though, that comes from the crowns that, wear, that Jesus Christ wears when he returns. So the word is not necessarily wrong. It depends on how it's used. Rulership used right, rulership used wrong, but it's the same word for diadem. But in order to have rulership, when Jesus Christ returns and those who come with him, they have to have had the crown of life. They have to have had the right faith, the right works that went with that faith in order to get the diadem part as well. And it is interesting, the same word for Revelation 20, verse uh, or chapter 20, verse 4, when uh, judgment and authority is given. It's the same word for diadem there, for those who will rule with Christ for a thousand years. So we see that there's an emphasis of the crown of life as more of a victory, of righteousness, of overcoming. And it's a part of what the Apostle Paul also writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we were there earlier and want to go back there and finish out a thought in this message for that we kind of talked about from the first message. The word crown here is going to be that Stephanos, that overcoming, the, the victor crown. And beginning in verse of 24 of chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians, it says, Do you not know that those who run a race all run, but only one will receive the prize? Run in a way in which you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way, not without aim. I box in such a way, not as beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave. In other words, I get control over it. So that afterwards I may preach to others and I myself may be disqualified. While we're in this human form, the Apostle Paul is even stating that he to fall away at the last. And that is something that you and I have to also understand as a part of endurance. We have to continue to the very end in order to meet the mark. Let's turn over to 2 Timothy. As Paul was entering the latter parts of his life, Maybe Jesus Christ allowed him to understand that he was about to die. I don't know for sure, but we know he's getting up in age. He knows that there was a certain authority over him, a bad rulership in the form of the Roman government, and he was, his time for this earth was, was short. And he makes the comment to inspire Timothy, beginning in verse 7. Consider what I say to you, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember. Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendants of David, according to my gospel. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter. No wonder that's not what I wanted to say. Chapter 4, verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course that I have kept with faith. In the future, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only to me but also to all who have loved his appearing. And you see that there's a promise for those who love, as James said. There's a promise of this reward, but it comes as a result of righteousness, and that righteousness and honor comes as a result of overcoming sin within us. Let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter, I'm sorry, chapter 5. I get the right chapter this time. First Peter chapter 5, Peter was making reference to, in using Jesus Christ as again the example, as the shepherd of the sheep. And he'll, I'll just back up to verse 1 for context. Therefore I exalt the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and as a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight 
not under compulsion, but voluntarily. So it doesn't matter how we do things. According to the will of God, and not for soul and gain, but with eagerness. Nor yet is lording it over as those allotted with charge. That's the wrong kind of diadem. But proving to be an example to the flock. That whole concept of proof. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. And, you know, you think about that. Uh, we are to ultimately be that kingdom of priests. To be shepherding, to be helping others. We won't be lording it in a wrong way. You won't be given the power to be a kingdom of priests if you're going to use it the wrong way. Your words won't be able to just let it just fall where it may if it hurts their feelings or not. That won't be the type of shepherd that we're talking about. Something for us to think about. So we go back to Revelation chapter 2. We think about what we've read here and how important it is for us to consider, you know, these messages to the churches. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last, who is dead and has come to life, says this, I know your tribulations, your poverty, but you're rich. The blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, so that you will be tested, and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful until death. And I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. 